Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what you know about benchmark? Uh-huh. They're speaking the facts that you wanna hear. They rap a jersey, the vision is clear. Diamonds glisten like a chandelier. You know what I'm here for, like Michelle Lynch. It clutch time, we do not flinch. Real brothers, we do not switch. Hit home runs with the right pitch. Who run the city? Ooh. What to do when they hating on you? I feel like Kobe 2010. Taking an L, all I need is a win. This is his business, you know how they go. They playing the seats, now it's time to grow. Tune in now, gotta be in the know. Showtime, bitch, my butter blow. We Woo. know. <laughs> hey, listen, man. We'll 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 have a good time. You know, what sure. good, good time. Sure. Welcome back to another episode of the Bitch Mob Podcast. We have today a very special guest, family. No need for an introduction, but everybody does not know Brevin Knight. So I'm gonna give you the introduction. Three-time state champion at Seton Hall Prep. Three-time first team All Pac-10. Still, right now at Stanford, he's fifth all-time in scoring with 1,714 points, number one all-time in assists at 780, number one all-time in steals at 298, 12-year NBA vet, number one in steals his rookie season, point guard turned analyst for the Memphis Grizzlies, co-host for podcast Night Court with Rob Fisher, Brevin Knight. How are you? Wow. I'm great, man. Dang, bro. That, that, that was pretty cool then. <laughs> I, 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 like, I like that intro. I got I got I gotta get y'all down with me more. I got you gotta travel with me. <laughs> oh. oh man, glad to have you on the show. We appreciate you taking time out your schedule. Um, first off, I just want to start off with I know you tweeted out because of the health protocols and everything, you haven't been able to be at the games to do the commentating. How are you feeling? And- going with you uh, health-wise uh health-wise I feel good I, I was never uh I never tested positive or anything it was more a close contact situation with with, with my family and so uh my son playing basketball one of his teammates got it that then it, it he didn't he didn't got it and so then I had to quarantine away from home so uh I, I felt, I've always felt great the good thing is I, I tested negative the whole time uh, he now is is negative and, and feeling good, and, and we'll get back out on the court. And, and so, uh, it's it, at this point, it's cool. It was at first, you know, have to go live in a hotel for for a week is is not the best thing to have to do. But we're used to being on a road. It's a little bit different having to do it at home. Uh, but other than that, I, I feel I feel great, and, and and was looking forward to getting back to calling games. Unfortunately, you know, with with our with our team that with the postponement of their games. We, won't be able to call games for a little while, but it's good to be back at home. Speaking of touching on that, um, of course, shout out for the good health. Touching on that, do you, in your opinion, do you think that maybe the NBA should consider a bubble because you have your team and you have the Wizards who haven't played since January 11th? Do you think that should be a consideration? Uh, it's, it's always going to be something that, that they definitely should could, could think about. I think at this point in time, uh, it, it becomes to the logistics of it. How how real would it be to be able to get all 30 teams into one, in one place? Where would that be? Of course, the G League is already going down to Orlando to be in their own bubble, to be able to, to, to play down there. Um, so it, it would logistically would be something that's hard, but real, if, if in the grand scheme of it, that would be the only way that if we're going to try to have a season without having these setbacks, that they, that they could go about doing it. If, as long as you can have others, as you see in my situation, with with my son playing and it being so far, being two places removed from myself, but it still can affect those guys that are playing, especially you have kids. They're, gonna, they're not going to stay in the house the entire time. So you try to, you try to do it as best you can in terms of being safe. But it, it's the reality of the world we're living in is that, it can get, it can still touch you even when you do everything correctly. So the, the only way that we could have 
no instances or at least you really be able to control the situation was if they were to go into a bubble. I mean, that's 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 definitely something I, that I feel like they're considering right now, too. I, mean, I know it would be tough for NBA players to be away from their family for so long with a 72-game season. That's a big part of the reason why they've gone away from the bubble format, right? But it makes me think, you know, you know, back in your time playing in the NBA in your era, like, how would that have gone over if you guys had to play in a bubble? How do you think it would have? How do you think it would have gone? I mean, I think we all would have, would have had to fight for it, but but for it to be one season, if you say, listen, for this one season, the sacrifice will have to be that you're gonna to have to just go and be in one area where if they do like they did in Orlando, in Orlando, I thought they did a great job of at least having enough outlets for the guys to do stuff. You could still go golf. They had bowling. They had the arcade. Uh, swimming pools were open. There was a uh, you can go out and fish, get on the plantoon. plantoon. So there were there were other things to do other than just go to a gym or go to the ballroom where they set up courts and go right back to your room. So it, for the one season, would it be hard? Yes. I'm not going to sit here and act like, oh yeah, sure. We'll do it. It'd be, it wouldn't be easy at all. But with, with all that is going on and you want to be able to still be able to get paid for a season and not have to go and say, well, we might not have a season at all. If you give guys the option of no season and not get paid, or go to a bubble and get paid, I promise you 100% of us will say, I'm going into the bubble. And I would have been one of those people that raised his hand immediately and said, put me in the bubble. What, what, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> that's a good, that's yeah. a good point, too. I mean, I, I, you know, another question that popped in my head, too, as you were talking, I know, you know, obviously you're a color commentator for the Grizzlies, right? Um, exciting time for them. Young basketball team, a lot of good players on the team. John Morant's one of my personal favorite players in the NBA. What do you, what's your outlook on the team, and what, what do you think they can do this year, um, the abbreviated season? Uh, I, I still think that they're they're a playoff team. Of course, it's not the championship is not something that, that that we'd be worrying about at this point. This team is still trying to grow, trying to get Jaron Jackson Jr. back healthy. We haven't had he hasn't played in, since. Uh, the bubble and went out in early on in the bubble when he hurt his knee. Uh, we haven't, Justice Winslow hasn't played a game with us at all since the trade was made uh, early in, in last season. And so once we have the opportunity to put everyone together, uh, I think they, they're a formidable opponent to anyone every night. As you said, with, with John Moran on the floor and his skill and, and just the, the, the energy that he brings to the floor, but also the comfort zone that he puts the rest of the team in. Uh, and then we have good, very good role players. And I always say, if you're going to be a good basketball team, you're only as good as your role players. Mm -hmm. Your stars are, 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 yes, what they are. And that'll be John Jaron. That, that'll be the stars. But everyone else, if they don't fulfill their role, then we'll, we'll still just be a team that has two very good players and it's the rest of them. So I, I think what has made this team be successful even last year has been their depth. And their depth, again, has shown through with, with the injuries, that they've sustained. And with job ja being hurt for the three weeks, even during this, during this season, they still were able to find a winning streak and be on this five game winning streak that they're on right now. And a lot of that is due to the fact of guys that come off the bench that had to step into the starting lineup, but they've been able to do it as a collective. So uh, I see them as, as still being a playoff team, a team that will be a tough out, but this, the, all of those experiences only help them as years go by. Sure. For sure. Um, One of the players, like you mentioned, um, Tyus Jones has been able to play yes. pretty well. And one of our other guests, Dion Mingo, was saying, y'all got to watch for Tyus Jones. He's solid. He's going to give you 10 and 8 every single night consistently and zero to maybe one turnover. Yes. Looking at that type of stat line, 10 and 8, 10 and 9, minimum turnovers, that's – speaks to your career yeah consistency assist zero turnovers steals i want to start with you where did that mindset come from to be so efficient because looking at your career you could score that wasn't a problem but you made sure you got players involved and you were a menace on defense so where did that style come from for you well, I think a lot of it was – we go back to when I was growing up, Shucks. I never I never even shot the basketball when I was younger. It was everything that I did growing up was 
steal the basketball, make layups. That was pretty – make sure that I got other people the ball because I felt like growing up in the parks back in East Orange, if I made everybody else on my team on the court happy, they were always going to pick me up. Like I never was going to have to sit on the side and have to wait three, four necks before I got back on the court. And so that, for me, it started at a young age to try to realize how can I be on the main court? Because at my park, Sauble Park, where I grew up, grew up, it was three courts. We had the little kids court, where well, that was little kids. Then we had two courts back to back, which was the like you almost there court, like like middle school, like kids you can see they could hoop, but you weren't playing with the grown men yet. I was trying to figure out I want to play on this grown man court, even as a middle schooler. Like how do I get in the height? How do I get on that court? And so I figured out. Keep everybody happy. Don't mess up on the offensive end. I don't need to shoot the basketball. If I get a breakaway layup, I'll shoot that. But I'll make sure you get the ball at the right time. And so that mentality started from when I was young. And I, and I found out that the happier my teammates are, the more I play. And so that just continued through high school. It was the same way. Now, of course, then you start to learn how to score. Uh, my junior year in high, in, in high school was when I had to then score a little bit more. But it was still – a lot of steals, a lot of easy layups, mid-range jump shots. I, I didn't shoot a three ball until I got to college. Like I never even attempted to shoot shots that far because I didn't have to. I was quick enough to get where I wanted to. Uh, and then once I got into the league, I tell people when you get into the NBA, you can go one or two ways. You can have let your ego keep telling you that I'm just as good as everybody else. I'm going to keep playing my way. Or you can figure out what role can I play in his league so that I become a 10 plus NBA player, 10 plus year NBA player. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to be 10 plus years because I knew that made me fully vested in my retirement. That made me, that, that also understood that insurance wise, any and everything that we needed was going to be taken care of. So it became a business decision for me in terms of what I was going to do in the NBA. And so I, I, I didn't, when the summertime came, that's when I bust people's ass again in the summer. Now we get back into it. When it's time for us to play summer league or go back home, now that's I play how I play. But when I was in the league, it was fit the role that was best for the team that I was playing for. And so that 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 was the entire mindset. If I get these guys playing well and they're happy, it's more minutes, it's wins for our team. Um, and then, you know, in those situations where it was expansion in Charlotte, it was like I got a chance to go back and be Brevin from Stanford again. Like my first year in Cleveland, I was that way. Um, but then those years in Charlotte, Bernie Bickerstaff allowed me to go play how I play. And, and so I scored more. I was more in, involved in, in that end of the game. But the other times was just, hey, do what you do really well that can help this team win, but will always get you another contract. Because mm -hmm. I tell people, once you get to the NBA, the sport of basketball comes becomes secondary. The business of basketball is first and foremost. And you better understand the business if you want to stick around. Hey, Greg, that, that, that literally is a common thing, bro. Like all of our guests that we've had so far at some point basically say, know your role and play your role. Yes. Yeah. I mean, listen, that's longevity. You, you know what I'm saying? You look at a guy like Jared Dudley, who's been in this league for 15, 16, however many years he's been around. Listen, I watch Jared tell people, watch Jared Dudley before a game when he's out there working out. He don't miss no shots. Yep. But when he gets into a game, if it's a blowout, whatever the situation, they down on numbers, you're not out there taking a lot of shots. You know, so it, 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 if, you, if you go watch a lot of these guys that play roles in the league, you watch them play in the summertime, totally different players right. than you see them play in the NBA for the guys that want to have a long career. Um, and, and so it's, it's, you got to make that decision. Is your ego going to mess you up or is your business sense going to allow you to have success? That's great advice because I, I know that one of the things I've always heard from people who play basketball and play at a really high level is, hey, work on a specific thing in your game and get really good at that, right? Get really good. And that's preparing you to play that role, right, to play to, to really fit into that team mold. So for you, growing up, obviously defense was your calling card, right? I mean, yep. <laughs> Dion yeah. came on the podcast and raved. He played against you in high school, raved about your defense, right? So. <laughs> It's it's crazy. Like, what were your workouts looking like when you were coming up? I mean, just I'm something I'm so curious about because obviously you said that offensive game came a little later for you. Quick, you get whatever you wanted on the floor. What were you working on the summers in high school and even even coming up as an end of your youth? 
Like I'll be real with you, yo. Nothing. I'll be honest with you, yo. Like like this 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 like uh training stuff and the working out. We never did that. We played every day. I literally played basketball every day. And so my working out was playing and it was figuring out how do I not take it back. I my dad was a, a high, was a college coach and then he was a college coach at Seton Hall University. So when I was younger, a lot of what I did was drills at the high school, shooting left hand layups the right way, left, right, left hand layup, little pull up jump shots, make sure I drip. I never really had the, the fancy dribble moves. I just ran by you. I'm going to cross you over or I'm going to see that you have one foot up, the other foot back. I'm going to attack that back foot and I'm going to beat you with my speed. Like I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do more than what I needed to do. And, and so that enabled me to be able to still be better than everybody. But I didn't do a lot of, there wasn't a lot of working out that I did when I, when I was coming up, it was just, we played all, we played every day, whether it was across the street at my park, traveling to other parks. Cause in East Orange, we had nine parks in our city. So it maybe go to another park to play, to play against some different people. Um, and then once I got into, college it was well where's the pro-am like that and, and that was the first time really that I ever worked out in my life was when I got to college and I, I worked out with our assistant coach who changed my jump shot Keith Larson helped me change my shot to where I became a shooter so we work out but then we work out during the day and the workout during the day he would get me to do it because he's like yo we got the pro-am later so I'm like all right well I'll get some shots up now because I know we got to play later but if you told me, like, a lot of these kids today, that's all they do mm. is they work out, work out, work out. And I say that a big problem with kids today is the application of what you're working on gets lost. So you go watch this kid in, in, a, in a gym with him and his trainer, two other kids. Oh, he looks phenomenal. Like, Man, this kid can play. But you put him on a court with nine other people, consequences, shot clock, time and situation. All of a sudden it looks different because – they haven't figured out how to use that skill in a game. And so for me, it was everything that I knew, everything I did on the floor, I've done it 100, 200, 1,000 times in playing up and down. And it's a big reason why in Memphis, why I lived in Memphis for as long as I did during my NBA career was because we played three, four times a week. We get in some hot gyms with the big fans in the door. We just get it in. And, and so at that that was my working out, even through my NBA career. Like dudes were like, "Come on, B, we're gonna go get these. We're gonna go get this workout." And I'm like, "We're gonna play afterwards, or y'all just gonna work out?" And I'm like, "No, we're gonna work out." I'm like, well, I ain't going. But if you want to play, you always know you can call me. I'm ready to play any, any, and every day. So, uh, and I think that a little bit of that, it helped a lot, but it also hurt me. Like I, I believe the combination of the two makes the best basketball player that you can be. Continue to work on your skill individually so you're confident that you can do it, but then to go and work on it while playing, I think if you can marriage the two and have a, a healthy balance, I think that makes the best basketball player. You start to lean one way or the other, then you start to, in some ways, you, you, you slight yourself. You don't give yourself the biggest advantage. Nah, that, that's smart too. And I saw a post the other day from a trainer that said the most important time to work out is midseason to keep sharpening those skills. So it definitely it speaks to the balance you're talking about and striking the balance. You mentioned yes. you have a son playing basketball right now. Um, are you instilling that that idea now that it has to be a balanced effort, like working out, playing, like you got to keep a balance there? Yeah, I, I, I do. The, you know, the, the hardest part though is, like I said, when, when, when I was younger, you know, and it was you just go to the park and get it in. Now you have to manufacture when they play. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of when they play, it has to be going to an AAU tournament or it's not a lot of open gym where you just go to the gym and y'all, and it's people just playing that. That's, that's almost like a lost cause at this point. It, it, so everything. So I try to, we definitely get, get the working out part of it in. Um, but then I try to figure out where, where can we go where somebody's just playing? I don't give you playing three on three, four on four, five on five, whatever that may be. Um, let's try to also incorporate that. So that has been, it's been a little bit harder to be able to do that. Um, and, and also the thing was when we played, basketball was free. You feel me? Like we just, we went and hooped. Now you got, you got to pay to do everything, pay to work out, pay to go in the open gym, pay, you know, like 
So, so it just, it, uh, the, the landscape of basketball has changed so much that for those people that are in those scenarios where you can just go to y'all go to your Y or you go wherever boys and girls club, or y'all can get in and play. That's still good. Like that's, that's great for, for, for those that can't and don't have that aren't in those areas, then you're trying to manufacture the combination of the two. You can always figure out somebody to work your kid out, but it's going to be somewhere like, can you work out? And then after you get done working out, can y'all play like that? That's the combination that, that I would love to, for there to be able to be a little bit more. Yeah. That's something that's rare nowadays. Like me and Greg was just talking about this, like now, especially during COVID, everything is $15, $20, $25 for an hour. Like you got to pay. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit to college, right? So Seton Hall right. Prep, state champion. How did you end up choosing Stanford, somebody from <laughs> Jersey, across the country, all the way to California? Like, Well, it, well, well first and foremost, my mom and dad, like, education was, was top of the list. Like, there, there was no basketball if, if, if my brother and our grades weren't right. Like, so you, you could think that you're going to go outside, you're going to go to the park, you're going to do all this stuff, but you come in this house with the wrong grades, that ain't happening. And I, and I think because of that, it just kept the drive of, well, I'm going to be a good student also. I'm a, and for, for my parents, being a good student wasn't enough. Like, you got to be a great student and because it'll pay off down the road. And, and it paid off for me. You know, for, I was, wasn't highly recruited at all. You know, I, I really had it down to SMU. I was going to go to SMU because they had a – uh, a black coach and John Shoemate, who was down at SMU. I had Manhattan because Fran Fraschella was the head coach at Manhattan College. He had recruited Ira Bowman from Seton Hall Prep when I was there. And so he watched me play at that point and was always in my ear about how good I could be. The basketball would always be with him wherever he went. And so, and then I was playing summer league at Elizabeth High School. And Trent, and then our, uh, our assistant coach, from Stanford was came to really watch somebody else play. Those games got canceled. So he just came to, to Elizabeth High School just to watch some games. Saw me play. When the game was over, he went to our coach and just asked, how was my grades? Could they recruit me? And started recruiting me from that moment based on, just based on that, on watching me play at that point. And then the recruitment just kept going from there. But if I'd never, did what I should have done or what I could have done on the school side. Once he went to coach and was like, Hey, can we recruit him? They're like, man, he's not, he's not a, a Stanford student, but because I was able, they were able to recruit me from that point. Hey, see my wife coming in back, <laughs> back in the, back in the background. <laughs> uh, uh, that they um they, that the, the recruitment kept going from that point. And then I went out to Stanford on the, uh, Recruiting visit. I only went on one visit. I went out to Stanford. We got, we visited, got done. Mike Montgomery went to office. He was like, I got one scholarship and it's either for you. The other player was Dan Earl from South Jersey was, was the other, other point guard. He's like, whichever one of y'all say yes first, um, that's who I'm going to give the scholarship to. So I was like, well, you just wait one sec. I went into the other office. I called my mom. I was like, Ma, this is what they said. And she was like, well, you'd be crazy not to take it. I was like, well, I was thinking the same thing. I went back in the office and was like, you can go ahead and get, you can go ahead and let Dan Earl, I already took the scholarship. And that's, and that's how I went to Stanford. And to this day, I still, me and Mike Montgomery still joke about the fact that he didn't even know who I was when I was sitting in that office. It mm -hmm. was, everything that he knew about me was literally just from what our assistant coach told him. And, and, and so that, that that was a story, and then once I went there, it was just I was like, well, listen, I'm here. I I, I like to play basketball, and I, I want to try to change the tone of how people see Stanford in terms of this basketball world, and mostly on the men's basketball side, because Tara Vanderveer on the women's side, they were already winning. She was already dominating uh, women's college basketball, and and that's that's what fans were going to see. Like they were going to see. The women, Stanford women's game. They weren't going to see Stanford men basketball, including me. So I, I was like, I want to see Stanford women's basketball too. That, dude, they're good. Um, and so that that's that that's 
that's how I ended up. I ended up out there. That's a cool story right there. Um, and that's something important too for our listeners to know. During that time, it was really big on academics. So right. for you to come there and the career you had there still top five in major categories shows that you definitely was helping change the culture and the vision of Stanford right. men's basketball. You look well, at that's it. what I wanted to do. That, that was the goal, yo. The goal, I, I told people, I told all our, all my teammates, I was like, man, listen, when we off this court, yo, I understand the Stanford name. The Stan- and I, like at the end of the day, I still wasn't your typical Stanford student. Like I'm blasting music in my dorm room turn. I had never, I guess when I got turned on to Snoop when I got out there, I never listened to West Coast rap before I got there. Man, I, they turned me on to that Snoop and it was all over. I turned the speaker around. I had a basketball court outside of my dorm room. So I would some some nights or days, I would go out there and shoot. I'm blasting Snoop out the window. And it wasn't a clean version. But to me, I it's just, just how we get down. Like I'm not really and that and so I was never the typical Stanford student, but I told them when we step on this floor, yo, no more that like the Stanford thing, like the <laughs> we're we're the Stanford students and we're we're uh intellectual and nah, nah yo we hoop like we step on this floor we hoop and, I, and so it's been it was good to see us go from it was like a movie I tell people like a movie my freshman year the people from my dorm first off when I told them I played basketball they were like oh like intramurals like you on the you play intramural basketball I'm like nah yo <laughs> like I'm on the basketball team you know like so they would come to the games and no lie they would sit in the stands straight across from our bench we had like bleachers that you pull out that was on the bottom part. And they would be sitting watching the game, doing their homework, books laid out on the, on the bleacher, doing their homework while we playing the games. Because it was that's how few people were at the games that they could come there and do that. Fast forward to the end of my sophomore year, probably in my junior, people are lining up to try to get into games to be able to come now. And so that it was fun to watch, to watch it transform into being like, Yo, Stanford men's basketball is something that you can do. And now to see it continue was just, you know, it's been fun. They got a special player now in uh, Zaire Williams. Yes. I watching him. I, I didn't know how good he was at Sierra Canyon until I watched the game a couple, about two, three weeks ago. Um, the kid is special. <laughs> he's, yo, yo. He's, I'm going to tell you another kid, though. Oscar De Silva is going is, is to be a, a, a good pro also. Uh, our big who can play inside out. Uh, has been forced to be play a lot of center, um, but won't be a center in the league. And so they they the talent, they've been they've been very good at being able to get talent this mm-hmm. as we the years have gone on. And so this is a credit to, to our coaching staffs, Jared Haas and, and his people. But even before that, um, we, we we did a good job of being able to continue to at least have the opportunity to win games on a regular basis. So it's like I said, man, it's, it's fun. And it's also fun to still be involved with the university. For sure. For sure. And a, and a question I had too, going throughout your college career, you know, um, I think the coolest thing about uh, the, the coolest thing that about the career of someone who know who knows they're going to go to the NBA or has an NBA career is the moment when you realize, Oh, I can go to the league. Like this is real. This can really happen. What was that moment for you? Like, like what was, cause I always wonder like, being on the outside looking in, what that's like for uh, someone who can go pro. Freshman year, man, we played Cal. Cal had Jason Kidd was there. Um, and we got done playing him. And I don't know if it was after the second time that we played him. He told me, he came to me and said, hey, man, listen, I just want you to know you could be a pro. And I was like, like, a, like an NBA pro? And he's like, yeah, like I never, like my, it was always a dream to play in the NBA. But it was never the goal. Like, it, I, that's not – the goal was to go to college, be able to get a college education, make some good connections, get a good job, and just live my life. Uh, that, that, was, that was what the goal was. The dream was to be an NBA player. And when, when he told me that, somebody that was at the level that, of who he was and, and uh, what he meant to basketball at that point, uh, and then all of the accolades that he had, for him to say that to me 
a light bulb went on. That was the first summer I ever worked out. It was also the first summer I never went back home. I stayed out at school that after that summer um, and just work. And that's when I, I started to work and, and to change my shot. I used to shoot the ball from over here when I was in high school. I used to bring it up to this left side and shoot it from over my left eye uh, to the point where we got it to move it to here, to shoot it correctly, to where I can shoot the ball with more distance. And so um, that was the, that was the eye of the moment. And then once we started to play, then the play against people like Ty Sedney, play against Damon Stoudemire. Uh, there's a guy at Oregon that I tell people, a lot of people don't know, Kenya Wilkins, who was an absolute terror for me to have to play against, uh, play against Mike Bibby, uh, Jason Terry. Um, the list goes on and on because the Pac-10 has such great point guards and to have success against those other good point guards, then it, it made me believe even more. Like, yo, you you really you really have a chance, yo. And then sophomore year, being able to play as well as I did in NCAA tournaments, like that's what really solidified it for me was my NCAA tournament games. That that was because now it's a big stage playing against people you really don't know. They're trying to do whatever they can to stop you, and they don't stop. And so that that's what that's when it it clicked. Like, yo, let's. Let's go to the league. I mean, why, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of transitioning into the league, so your rookie year, you get drafted by the Cavs. Yep. You have Sean Kemp there, yep. Jonas Kowskis. Nobody is really seeing y'all as a playoff team. Y'all make the playoffs your first year, rookie year. How was that experience for you? You're coming from, like I said, you came to Stanford and you're straight first year in the playoffs all rookie first team and you playing with one of the most athletic, exciting players in Sean Kemp, which is a dream for a point guard that actually passes. How was that like? It was a dream, man. It was also a dream because I got to do it with a bunch of young guys. I mean, we, we, we had five rookies because myself, Derek Anderson, uh, Cedric Henderson. We had Zedrunas Ilgowskis, who was in essence a rookie because his first year, uh, he broke his foot, so didn't play at all his that first year. So he was playing with us was his first time, and so to have that many young guys play and to then play with Sean Kemp, it was just like it was heaven, man. It was like I'm I'm playing with the Rain Man. You know what I'm saying? Like we sit next to each other. His lock is right there. This is my lock. Cause like I think I walked in and just took a picture that said night. It said Kemp. It said night. I was like, yo, I just gotta take a picture. Yo, send this back home. Like I'm playing with Sean Kemp, yo, and, and and the thing for with with Kemp was he made it easy for us though. Like he he didn't make it he didn't make it hard on us at all in terms of trying to make us be super before it was our time. All he mm -hmm. the biggest thing for him was we gonna work hard every day and we got a chance to be good because individually yo we were good enough and so um, it was it was fun to man to just experience it with a bunch of other. Bunch of other young guys uh, with a nice mix of veteran guys. Fratello was, you know, a Jersey guy. So to have him as a, a coach, I tell people he was an ass, but but that that's what made him who he was. And that's mm -hmm. what made me love him. And that's what kind of built me up to be the player that I could be moving forward because how hard he was on me. He expected so much of me. And it's not, it's very rare where you come in and you tell this rookie, like, and it didn't start – wasn't right from the beginning. I didn't start right from the beginning. It was some games in to where it just started to be like, well, we're just better with him on the floor. And 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 if I – and he expected me to play like a starting point guard in the NBA when you go out there and compete. And so to have a guy like Kemp, though, to, to alleviate a lot of the pressure. Like, if I start getting worried about what we're going to do, I'm just going to call turn four. Listen, turn four. Just turn off of Kemp, throw the ball, yo. And we just sit back and watch them work. And then to make it to the playoffs, we got hit with a dose of reality because we were riding high. You know, chest poke now, we finished. We went from, oh, just the young kids on the block with Kemp to we finished six in the Eastern Conference that year. And so we play against – and we won at six because we are like, we want to play Indiana. That's what we want. They're older. And Mark Jackson was at the point. Reggie Miller was there. They had the Davis brothers. They had – and but – we felt like our speed, our quickness would be too much for them because that's what we were able to use during the regular season against them. And then we can learn real quick what playoff basketball is. Mm -hmm. All of that, you quick and all that stuff, those dudes were pros. And, and, and 
ended up losing that first round series. I think we lost three one. Um, but it was it was eye opening to see the different level of basketball once you got to the playoffs. No matter no matter what we did again the regular season, that was a different level. And I say that I think a lot of our careers got derailed a little bit or in terms of being able to take that Cleveland team farther with the lockout, because right after that season, we had the lockout the next year. And so that shortened the season. The other thing that hurt was Wayne Embry, who was our general manager with Cleveland, they started to kind of nudge him out. Um, and then there was a, there became sort of this, a big fight with front office, with the team, uh, kind of with how ownership and some of the people that were in the owner's ear at that time, it just, it, 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 the business side, the management side of the game threw off our team. We started trading pieces of guys like Vitaly Potapenko, who was great, who we loved. They traded him to Boston. Um, it, it, it really hurt. It hurt the chemistry of our team. Of course, we know Kemp came back with the weight thing happened with him. But I tell people, I don't care how much weight he gained. He still was 20 and 10. That's how skilled he was and how smart he was in the game of basketball that even though he no longer was flying over the top of people and doing that, he still was able to dominate games. But uh, the, the management situation, the stuff that happened with Fratello, changing coaches, bringing in Randy Whitman, that, that whole thing just, it was just a, it, it put a sour taste in our mouths. And, and I, it, it let us see the business. Like I was telling you that the business side of basketball is way bigger than the sports side of basketball, because if anything, if it was still the sport, they would not have messed with our team at all because we had enough. We had so we had such a promising uh, start to our careers and where it could go that they just scrapped it because of I think a lot of it just a lot of ego has gotten away. Yeah, that's we see that too often. We see that too often. We see teams that they have promise and it's like yo, if they have one more year together, two more years, and then they end up breaking it up for whatever the reason may be, finances, the right. owner a different way. It's a bunch of different things that go into it. Being that you played in the league for 12 years, you played on nine different teams, you definitely can speak to the business side of it. How did it feel for you to be traded and going through that? At some point, did you become like numb to it? Like how was that for you playing on nine different teams? Well, it, it, I became numb and a lot of it though was – like it was okay. – so I played with Atlanta, played with Cleveland for three and a half years, and then I got traded to Atlanta, played with them for a half a year. Then that next summer I got traded to Memphis, played in Memphis for two years. Then the start of the third year, realized that this wasn't going – this wasn't going to be a place that I could keep – I wasn't going to be able to keep further in my career if I stayed there. So we pushed for a trade, and then one season – I played for Memphis, Phoenix, uh, Washington, and Milwaukee, all in one season. And, and so a lot of my – the nine teams I played for, four of them came within – really, you say five of them, five of those teams were all short-term stays mm -hmm. for me. And, and that one season uh, was, was – I just kept asking for a trade because I was in a contract year. And in that contract year, you got to play and so that you can continue to show that you deserve to be there. And so um, it, it's, it's part of the business, man. Like, like, yes, I was numb to it because I asked for a lot of them. Um, mm. and, and so when you when you put yourself in that position, then you better be ready to move. And, and so when those calls came, it was just hey, I got to go to the next one. I go to the next one um, until, it, you know, you find a home that fits you. And, and that's what I did. I had a chance. Shucks, I was out of the league after uh, after that seventh year, sixth or seventh, I think my seventh year with playing. I played the playoffs with Milwaukee. Um, we lost to Detroit, and it was like, that might be it. And then Bernie Bickerstaff said, hey, look, I'll give you a training camp deal. No, Not no real contract, just a, a contract to come to training camp. And, and told me that I was the third point guard in training camp behind Omar Cook, I think, from – from uh, St. John's, I think that was his, that, uh, Jason Hart, Syracuse, still my boy today, uh, assistant coach out of USC, good dude. Uh, and then it was me. 
And so I was like, look, Bernie, if you give me a chance to be there, I won't be the third point guard by the time we get to the midpoint of training camp. So he was like, hey, if you got that confidence, well, let's see what happens. And then, you know, everything worked out the way it did in Charlotte. It really, that revived my career to be able to play another five years. And, and but it was also, I felt like, I felt like myself again, like I was playing basketball again. Like I wasn't, I wasn't worrying about the business of the game. I was just worrying about just hooping. My brother was in Asheville playing in the, and at that time it was the D league. So I got a chance to go up and watch him play. He would come down and stay with me. And unfortunately that's where he broke his leg. And then he had to come live with me and rehab. And so just the love for basketball, but also I had a chance to now kick it with my brother and, and being six years apart in age, we never really had that chance to really fully connect. Like that was, that was like maybe a, a first time where it was like a full connection for the two of us. And, and so that those, you know, you, you get, you get used to it, man. It, it's something that you, that you know couldn't happen. Uh, and and I, I roll with those punches, but it, it made me, it made me be a tougher person, it made me be, be a better, a better player at the end of it. And, and so uh, I, I, you know, you 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 better be you better be ready for it because the majority of us that play in the NBA at one point or another you will be traded. Yeah, you know it, it, it's so crazy hearing you talk walk through your career and and you know, there's a million different ways like a million different questions I could ask. Um, one question I really wanted to ask you, um, you were talking about the rookie year, making it to the playoffs, playing with Sean Kemp, like just that like aha moment, like I'm really in the league on the court. Like when was that? Like what? Can you remember the welcome moment and the welcome to NBA moment that you had? Because every every single player in the league talks about that moment. I love hearing these stories. Um, what was that? Well, for you? mine was was shucks, playing against Chicago Bulls. You know that that was that that was, you know they they were coming off a championship. Um, we play them for the first time in Cleveland, and they come running out of the locker room, and I tell everybody, oh, this was like. You know, they got those old Bulls videos when they run out and they, it's like slow motion. They just run like this. It looked like it's slow motion. The, we had the bell bottom, uh, the bell bottom little, uh, the pants. So you do the tearaways that, and everybody's just, and so this is what it looked like in real life, yo. Like we, me and Cedric Henderson literally stopped, yo, and was watching them run out the tunnel. We in layup lines. We got out before them. Layup, we in them two line. And we get there and we literally just stopped. And we just watch him run out. It's like, yo, I'm about to play against Michael Jordan, yo. Like, not it was – Scotty was hurt, so he wasn't playing. But it was like, yo, Michael Jordan. Yo, that's Phil Jackson about to be standing – sitting at the head of the bench coaching, yo. Like, this is the NBA, yo. Like, mm -hmm. now we in the NBA. And to, then to go out, personally have a good game, we win the game, it was like, yo – Yo, we could be good. Like that, that, that was that was not just a like a ha ha you here moment. Mm -hmm. It was also like a yo, like we could be a like a good team also. And, and so, I always tell people that just to watch them run out of that tunnel for Sean Kemp to run by and slap us both in the back of the head, tell us yo, we got a game to play. You can't just be standing there admiring the opponent, yo. Like we about to play against them. It was uh, and to watch Mike have a twenty plus quarter while we played him. It was it, it just was it, it it was fun. We told Bob Sir, yo, shut up, yo. You don't have to talk to him no more, yo. You yo, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> so that that was I say was my was my was was my aha moment to say we were there. And then once we went to when we went to the All Star weekend to to say that you were able to be All Star uh, to play in that rookie game. Um, all of the festivities that went around it to have my my parents, my family, since we right there in the city, my family was there the entire entire time. My wife, she was there. She was pregnant with our first daughter, so she was there hanging out with us also. And so uh, that 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 was the, the next one was like, yo, we had All Star Weekend, yo, like playing an All Star Weekend. This is this is unreal. Wow, for you during your career as a player. Were you more of a homebody, or did you enjoy the nightlife? Uh, the 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 first the first season was enjoy everything. 
the first season was blew all of my money, <laughs> which was the, was was the was the first season, and, and a lot of that was because we're in Cleveland. It was like a six hour drive from Jersey, so it, I mean we a nine hour drive from Jersey, so it would literally be like every every weekend we had I, I had my boys would be there, so we would it would be go to the games, get something to eat. We had a, a spot that we would always go to just to kind of hang out at. And so, uh, yeah, we, we, we lived, but Sean Kemp was, was this also was good. He also was very good with telling us what you don't want to do. Like people can talk about all of the things you want to say about them, but he was perfect for, for young players to say, you might not want to do that. Like certain roads I've been down that you don't have to go down. And, and so it was, yeah, man, we 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 enjoyed we we enjoyed the life. It quickly became like that was cool that we did it for that time, and then that was it. Like it, it kind of it didn't have the same, didn't have the same thrust from there because then I was like, I'm not the hell with losing this money, just spending money like this, just <laughs> going and doing, and nah, I'm, huh, I'm it's, it's time to save now. Like we we had our fun, now and now it's it's time to save, and so. Uh, I, I quickly became more of uh, more of a homebody. I never the the clubs just I'm not good with. I wasn't good with too many people being around and not knowing what everybody was into because I still wasn't. I wasn't a like I went to clubs that made that that I was familiar with. So so a lot of people they're like, yeah, that's kind of grimy yo to go there. I'm like, yeah, but this this kind of what I know. Like y'all want to go? I don't I don't know those high class places and I don't really, that's not, that ain't me. And so uh, it, we also realized that you had to change the way you was moving after mm -hmm. you get to a certain point, can't move the same way. Right. And so and then it just became, I'm cool to go, golf became a big part of my life after I started to get a couple of years. And so that, that became bigger than anything. It seems to be a common trend with NBA vets is like you, you go from, you know, the early stages, like oh, I'm here, like I got all this money, like let's enjoy it. And then you kind of transition, you get older and you're maturing as you as you're in the NBA, not just as a player, but as a man, you pick up yeah. habits to golf. Like, and that's really, really cool to hear that and hear that the maturation process. Um, one question I had too, coming out of Stanford, right? Every single every single time you leveled up and played at a higher level, there was a difference in the level of play, I'm sure, obviously, from going from Seton All Prep and playing at a high level there to going to Stanford and playing at a high level there, right? What was the jump? from college to the NBA, like in, in terms of the level of play, the kind of players you were playing against? So I tell everybody, it, it wasn't as big of a jump as for me um, as it may be for other people because I didn't have to change what I was doing to get there. I didn't, like, I, I was I was 5'9 and 3 quarters, you say, say 5'10. I was always 5'10. So to play against bigger people like I was I've always played against bigger people like even when I was a kid I was playing against bigger people so that side didn't change uh the speed but like everybody say well the speed of the game is so much faster I think that I was my IQ and the way that my dad talked to us about the game already mentally had us prepared to play the game at whatever level you wanted to play it at whether it was play fast, whether we had to slow down, we're going to be in the half court, we're going to push the basketball. Like, a lot of what we did was, like, I, my dad, we didn't do a lot of working out. I went to the gym and was, but what we did was a lot of mental basketball. So we sit and watch a game, it would be, why did that happen? What would you have done in that situation? So that didn't change. Once I got to the league, it just became mentally, how do I now outthink everyone else on the floor? And so it, it, the physical side of it, I was still the fastest guy on the floor. I was the fastest guy on the floor when I was in high school. I was the fastest guy on the floor when I was in college. I was still the fastest guy on the floor when I got to the league. Now, though, it just became, well, mentally, how do I get people to play hard when really they're worrying about themselves? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the biggest key because when you walk into a locker room, it's 12 to 15 individual business people. Right. And, not, it's, it's, and how do you get those 12 to 15 individuals to just play as a collective when I need you to play as a collective? So mm -hmm. that that part of the game, that didn't change for me. Like, I had to do that 
when I was in high school as a sophomore playing with all seniors, how do I get them to play and believe in me? When I went to Stanford, it was like, all right, I got to get these guys to believe that they're better than what they think they are. And if we do this together, then we can be good. And when I got to the league, it was like, well, how can I just try to get through to this guy that us being this good only makes you look that much better? And so the, the, the game in, in terms of that, it was just, it was always a mental game for me. The physical side of the game didn't change much. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't worry. I didn't worry much about the physical side. It was more the mental side. It's because playing the way that I played, I was going to need for my team to be good in order for me to be good. I was going to at least need for my team to be competitive in order for me to look that way. And so that, that was the biggest challenge. That's a gem. That's a real gem. So I mean, I talk to the kids that I coach AAU. I coach AAU uh, at a program uh -huh. called Uni Legends in New Jersey. And there was one game we played where it was just horrible. It was a lot of mental errors. And I remember talking to them in the locker room just going, hey, guys, like, we don't watch enough basketball as, as a team. Like, I just don't think yes. you guys enough watch enough basketball. I think that is so much more important than you guys give it credit for being. I understand working out is important. Playing is important. But if you're not watching and watching guys who play at a higher level than you, you're not going to learn what to do on the court. You can't, it's, it, that's a part of real life application. So that's yeah. huge. I, I appreciate you even, you know, sh sharing that there because that's a big part of this, I feel like. Yeah, man, the, the, the mental side of the sport is as big as the physical side. And, and you'll yeah. see and a lot of that, the mental side also then goes along with confidence. Mm -hmm. Like mentally, if I feel like I'm there, I'm with it, then I'm confident to go out and play and use the physical abilities that I have. If I'm not there mentally, I'm not confident, then those physical, those physical abilities you have become limited. Right, 100%. That's definitely a major important part. And that's life too, the mental aspect. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's a life lesson right there. Couple questions before we transition to the last segment, before we get you out of here. Again, we thank you and appreciate yeah. you hopping on. Our viewers, our listeners, again, this is Brevin Knight on the Bench Mob Podcast. It's a treat, man. Nah, 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 this is good, man. This, this, I, I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> I got, again, because we got my brother going. My brother's going to quiz me here tonight because my brother coaches at Rutgers. They're mm -hmm. playing Penn State right now, so I got it up on the TV. I got to make sure that I rewind because he, when it's over, we got to sit down and, and analyze what went on with them. Yeah, you know, shout out to Brandon. Shout out to Brandon. Yeah, shout out, shout out to Rutgers. They they played played really well. They started out really well this year. Um, a they're little rough Rutgers. patch. A little rough patch right now. Look, they're down. Yeah, they're listen, down the Big Ten, the best comp, Big Ten's the best conference in college basketball right now. Facts. So so they 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 they'll find their footing again. They'll they'll mm -hmm. be all right. No, I, I love that coaching staff all together. Him, Peichel, um, love love, yeah. that, love what they're doing uh, with the program for sure. I've seen it from like like when they weren't that great to now where they're really good with Geo and. And they got Ron Harper. They got uh, Paul McKay. I love their team. So, big fan. Yeah, and Jacob Young, that's my guy. I, I really – I like the way that he – I like the energy of which he plays the game. Yeah. It's palpable. You can feel he's fast, fast lefty. I love lefty. Fast, lefty. and he just – he going to give it his all no matter what. That's a fact. That's a fact. Speaking of um, players that you like, who in the league do you like to watch um, right now? Now, I already know because I listen to Night Court. Obviously, you like watching John Morant. Mm -hmm. Out of Memphis, outside of Memphis, who do you like to watch? I'm I'm a, I'm a big Colin Sexton fan, and, and I've been a Colin Sexton fan since he was at Alabama. Uh, just because of the determ, I, I, he's like a a smaller Russell Westbrook in terms of doesn't take a playoff, like and, and he's he's coming at you the entire time. I also had a chance to to catch a video of him when he played against East High School, which is here that when Penny was coaching at East High School here in Memphis, they played against, I think it was a Pebble, I can't remember the name of the high school he went to. I think it was They Pebble. played against East, huh? No, I think it was Pebble Brook. I think yeah, so, exactly. They went, they went, they played against East, and, I mean, he was going at them, but he was also going at Penny. Like, And I'm like, yo, this dude right here, man, it, it's, it's like he, 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 I, I like the, I like the anger at which he plays the game. Like he ain't out here joking around. Like, and forget all that smooth. I'm, nah, yo. Like I'm out here to wreck you. Like that's all I came to do. I came to be the best player on the floor, and I'm, that's how I'm playing. And so uh, I, I, I enjoy I enjoy watching him play. Uh, I'm a big Steph Curry fan. I just I just I think people I don't I don't think people don't appreciate 
the totality of his game. Like, of course, he shoots the ball from deep and he does all that. But the way that he finishes around the basket, the way that he handles the ball, uh, how he empowers his teammates to also be good. Like, it's not just about him. And, and, and so uh, to watch him, I, I'm a big LeBron fan. I, I, listen, people, just because to be able to have the, the, the longevity that he's played the game with, but he plays the whole game. Like, it's, it's, it's get people involved, it's score. Every time we say he can't do something, somehow he's still right there doing, doing just that. Uh, and, and so th- those, those are people that are th- – those, those three are people that I, I can say that I, that I can enjoy. I mean, there's probably some other people, but that I, off the top of my head, I would say I, I would watch. But that young bull in, in Cleveland, he, he's got a big, he's got a big fan in me. Right, he's special. I, I uh, suffered. He just gave me PTSD thinking about last night. I see what you had on. And he showed a, he showed a different side last night. You know, usually a lot of he do a lot of his work mid range, yeah. getting to the paint, shooting, knocking down a three. And if, if he if he does that, then whew, yeah, watch our league. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that was a warning shot to the league last night. <laughs> it was. Don't sleep. Don't sleep. All right. On on Heavy Live with Scoop B, that show, you mentioned you think IT can help a playoff team. What gives you that impression, and what team do you think now that he could possibly get on and actually have an impact? Well, I think any any veteran team he could play for, but in a team where he comes off the bench, um, uh, and so any team that's a, a playoff contending team, like no need no need for him to go play on a just a a upstart or a rebuilding situation. I don't think he has that many years left in him to play. So so one of these one of these teams that that will could use a little punch off of the bench. I, like I said, which team? I don't know, but he he can still be a player that when things aren't going right and you just need somebody to change the tempo of the game. Then he can be that he can be that guy because he scores the ball, he can score the basketball, he can still the speed that he still can be able to play with, um, but also just the experience that he has. It's it's uh, it's almost the, the same way as Lou Will does with the Clippers. What Jamal Crawford did all of the years of him being in the NBA, those guys that I don't need you to run a play for me. I just need you to put the ball in my hands. Set me a screen, maybe I'll come off a down screen. They just have a knack for being able to score. So, so I think uh, he, there's still definitely a place. And because he, you know, he's had to rehab and been away, then the, the wear and tear on his body is less. Uh, but he, he, can, he definitely still has the ability, I believe, to help a, a playoff contending team. And not one of your bottom up, but one of the teams that have aspirations of winning at least through a first round. I agree. I'm a big IT fan. A lot of people don't agree with me when I talk about it, but I think he has a lot left in the tank for sure. So I, I just personally, that was for me. I wanted to ask. <laughs> we could post a clip and like see an NBA player agree, <laughs> that agree with you. Exactly. <laughs> um, I know we're going to transition to some football questions. My man on the right is a Giants fan. Um, he loves that you love the Giants. So yeah. I'm going to let Next is a Giants question. I'm Cowboy, so I'm, I'm out of oh, this. Oh, shit, hell no. I got no answers for you. <laughs> I got, I got, I'm just letting you know I got no answers for you. Hey, man, I don't know how you come from Jersey and you're a Cowboys fan. It never makes sense to me. Um, But as the yes. resident – you see what I'm saying? But as, as the resident Giants fans on the show, I just – I, how do you feel about the team? And more importantly, really, how do you feel about Daniel Jones? Like, are you convinced that he's the franchise quarterback of the New York Giants? Um, I, I'm, I'm – I'm willing to still give him time. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't feel like we need to draft another quarterback at this point. I think there are other areas, other teams that can be focused on with draft picks uh, other than worrying about getting another quarterback. And, and because uh, he showed us when he's healthy, uh, when when he has a little of a line that his line is blocking. Well, I thought the offensive line got so much better as the season went along. That was a, a big improvement us where we have been struggling for the last couple of years uh, and just missed on every lineman just about. Uh, And so to be able, I I think that his ability to 
stand in the pocket sometimes, but to be able to use his legs, some play action, get outside the pocket, be able to pass the ball, I think that's good. If we try to say he's going to be like Eli and just be a pocket passer, then that's, that's all out the window. And I thought that's what really hurt our season this year was when he came back, I don't think he was ready to come back. And when he came back and they said, oh, it'll just be a pocket pass, I was like, well, that's it's not going to help us. That, that, that's not what he did well. He stayed in the pocket. He's susceptible to turnovers from fumbles, Mm-hmm. Not able to get out, get on the outside and be a threat. So that I, I, I'm willing to rock with him for mm-hmm. to see what he's able to do. Is, is he franchised in, in terms of the longevity like we had with Eli? I don't know that yet. But for right now, um, I'm fine with, with Daniel Jones as our quarterback. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I agree with you. I, my stance on it is simple with Daniel Jones. I think that he has like some redeeming qualities as a quarterback that you want to see in your guy. That lets me know he could be a high-level player in the future, an all-pro right. quarterback, because he's got the legs, like you mentioned. He's accurate. He throws a good ball. He really yes. does. When he has time, yeah. he throws a good ball. So I just think that they have to get him more weapons on the outside. He needs a burner. He needs a true number one wide receiver. I love yes. Slayton. Love Shep. I, I'm Ingram concerned me a little bit this year. Like Bro, I see my, you, know, yeah, you know, I'm almost off the Ingram train. Yo. See, like you you can't you can't miss you can't be considered a top level receiver and miss as many balls as he misses. It's just ridiculous. It's just, it's just like, I'm, I'm talking about like, like, and not, I'm not even talking about like hard catches, the basic right. catch, like, and we need you to show up every week. Like I, we can't, it can't be, Oh, he had a great week. And then all of a sudden he's MIA for two, three weeks. And then, right. so I'm, right. I'm almost off the, I'm almost off the Evan Ingram band. I'm, I'm getting, I'm de- I got one foot off of it. I'm hanging on. <laughs> I'm trying to hang on. But I'm I'm close to jumping off of him all the way. I think it's a one year proposition with him. He's got one year left to really clean it up. I hope he lives in the jugs machines this summer because I lo- yes. I think he's a good dude. I think he's supremely talented. He's got yes. all the tools you need to be a very good player in the league for a long time. But it's just hasn't clicked yet. So I'm just waiting. But you know, your Daniel Jones affirmation is enough for me. I appreciate that because I I think he's gonna be a very good player in the league. I really do. And I think I, I agree. Good. Yeah, I really believe that. But you know. But our resident Cowboys fan here doesn't agree with me. Some of our other co-hosts don't agree with me. So, you know, I get clowned a lot for it. I, don't, I got you. I got you on that one. Hey, bro, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to transition to the last segment. With the quickness segment, we're going to ask you some, like, rapid-fire questions. Whatever comes to your mind, that's how you answer it. And then that'll, that'll wrap up our episode right here. First one, something simple. What's your go-to meal? Uh, spaghetti with meat sauce. Great choice. Can't go wrong with that. Wrong. That's classic. Greg, you already know the vibes. You know what's next. That's right. So, uh, Brett, I've asked everybody on the show. I got to ask you, too. Have you had the Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich? And have you had the Popeye's chicken sandwich? Have Neither. you had either? Neither. Neither. Nah, I don't even can do it. Can't do it. I, I mean, said, nah, yo. Neither. I'm, I'm, I'm a, if, I go to, if I go to Chick-fil-A, I only get nuggets and yeah. those fries on waffle fries are are banging with that lemonade is off the chart. Um, and if I go if I go to Popeyes, I'm only getting spicy wings. And if I if y'all go if I pull up, and you tell me oh we only got regular. I'm pulling off. Sheesh. Hey, you know what? That's smart man. Going to Chick Fil A and getting the nuggets only. That's my that's my thing now. I, I've I've gotten up the chicken sandwich over there. I was gonna ask you to compare chicken sandwiches. How about you compare the chicken overall? Which which place you think you have does better chicken overall? Oh well, well the the it's this difference because. I'm only getting wings. There's no. I think Popeye's got the best wings. We got a place in town here called Gus's Fried Chicken that's off the chart. But in terms of fast food, there, there's there, there's something about Popeye's wings. Now, the only thing I say about these Popeye's wings is lately they're starting to look like Kentucky Fried Chicken steroid wings. Like they used to just be the smaller, nice. Those I was like, that's why I like them. Then I started getting them like, yo, why are these getting so big, yo? Just I just want the regular size. Chicken wings. So the the best nuggets out of anybody is Chick-fil-A. They got the best nuggets. And they got the best lemonade. Uh, and those waffle fries are, are banging, but McDonald's fries are slamming too. Uh, and 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 Popeye's, they got the best chicken in terms of there's like two different chickens. That's you right. know what I mean? Like yeah, it's, it's, it's two, they got the best. If you're talking about like out of churches, out of all any other chicken plate, Kentucky fried chicken. I'm going Popeye spicy wings though, not the regular one. 
I think he'd be, I think off that answer, he can say that's a vote for chocolate, the Popeye's chicken sandwich. It's the same chicken in a brioche bun. I, I think, <laughs> so we're going to go with that. <laughs> I'll rock with it. <laughs> I got to agree. If I'm going to go to Popeye's, it can't be mild. It can't, it got to no. be the spicy kind. Yes. It's been like that since I was a kid. Anytime my mom, we went there, it was spicy. That was it. That's <laughs> all. With red beans, I want red beans and rice and the mashed potatoes, yo. And then we gone. <laughs> That's it. Who's in your musical rotation? Like right now, who do you listen right to? Right now, man, I'm I'm a, I'm a big Rick Ross fan, man. I'm 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 a big uh, uh that's I listen to that the, the most and then I listen to like I listen to all like old rappers. Like like I said, I'm Snoop, I listen to Jay-Z. Uh I, I tell my son too many of these new rappers, yo, things all sound the same, yo. Like, it's just, I call it mumble rap, yo. Like, I don't even know what he say. Like, can you tell me what he said, yo? <laughs> like, and so, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm old school. I'm, I'm, I like rappers, yo, that I can, I can understand. Like, I listen to Drake, uh, but I'm, I'm a hip hop dude. And then I, but I'll get into my, I'm also a big Mary J. Blige fan. Like, I, I can listen to all of Mary's albums. Love Mary J. Blige. When, from when, from when, whenever you can, I can play that all the time. Yeah. Hey, shout out to Mary J. Blige because she's killing it as an actress too. She yes. Power. Hey, transition. Listen, you gotta keep listening. You gotta be versatile in this game. Mm-hmm. Don't try to pigeonhole me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love it. I love the show. Overall, but nah, she's great. Who is your NBA champion this year? Lakers. I thought the Lakers got better. Adding Schroeder. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that that was that was good. Gasol will give them a, a nice center inside. Montrez Harrell gives them. You talk about those people that six man. Uh, who who are those? Montrez Harrell, fantastic six man. Um, uh, what's the shooter used to be in Portland? Was in Dallas. You know, does the the oh West Matthews. West Matthews. Yeah. I think West Matthews will be big for them because. Make shots on, but he's also a defender. That, and I think that's why LA for me is because they're they're the they can be the they'll be top three, top five in the two categories, which are offense and defense. Mm-hmm. They can smother you on the defensive side, but then they can exploit you on the offensive side. They can play big, or they can size down some. I like Caruso with what what he's able to do on that team. Um, Caldwell Pope would, would so they they got they have some they got some guys that also can get up and down the floor. I, I just think uh, the at the end of the day they'll they'll be champs again. Thoughts on the new look Nets? Just throwing it out there. Let's see what you think about them. I know what Listen, I think. Man, I the thing here's the thing with the Nets, man. I'm gonna say there's no denying the talent of the three people, but I, I don't even talk about that. Defensively, how are you gonna stop people? Cleveland, a team that only scores 105 points, just put 147 mm-hmm. of the other day. And then this small ball. There's a dude that's sitting on the bench next to Steve Kerr. I mean, next to uh, uh, yeah. Steve Nash. His name is Mike D'Antoni. Mm-hmm. Love to play small basketball. And I think that y'all, they're going to get court playing, trying to play too much small basketball with Kevin Durant being your pseudo five. And they're not going to be able to rebound. They're not going to be able to defend every position on the floor. And so uh, I just think that at some point in their depth took a huge hit. With losing the people that they that they lost, with and with Dinwiddie being out, so I think at the end of the day they'll still be they'll still be right there in the running for Eastern Conference champs. But they're gonna have to figure out how they round out the rest of their team. How can they rebound? How can they defend at a high level on a consistent basis? I, I couldn't agree more. This it's, it's, you know I'm not a homer. I agree with your analysis because I don't think they're gonna win an NBA championship. I think they'll get through the Eastern Conference. I think they're going to have to look for guys like JaVale McGee to hit the wire, like maybe on a buyout market. I'd love to get right. JaVale McGee and guys like that on the team, but they need specialists, rebounding and defensive specialists. So yes. I can agree more. Yeah, because, I mean, listen, they lost they lost a lot, man. They lose Levert. Another person people don't talk about, Torian Prince, was a, yeah. was a guy that gave you a versatile defender, could play different places. And Jared Allen, I love DeAndre Jordan, but DeAndre Jordan can't play 34 minutes a game. Like, you can't get that out of him. And so he can give you 24, 25 really good minutes, mm-hmm. be a nice talking piece in the back. But when you talk about being able to have a guy, when he goes out, then who you put in? You got, you got, you got nothing. So got nothing. Uh, I think it's gonna be, it'll be tough when they play against a good team. Yeah. Your top five favorite 
teammates of all time in the NBA? Uh, well, still my boy today, man, Cedric Henderson. As we hung out the, my our entire Cavs careers, and and still now we still we still hang out. Um, uh, I'd say Sean Kemp because he he put us on the right path when we were when we were younger in terms of how to be how to be professionals. Uh, Gerald Wallace was, was that, that was my my boy in terms of my my steals guy. We used to battle and and to who was gonna get more steals and nights. That was a crazy thing. Like you would get people that wanted to battle for points. He and I never battled for that. Uh, Keith Bogans played at Kentucky. Um, he was he was he was a a, a great teammate of mine. Uh, Shoot, I, I I don't know who to. I gotta try to try to see who would have been my 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 fifth my fifth best teammate. I, I would say somebody that I I admire how he played the game. Like we didn't do a lot of hanging out, like because I didn't have I don't have a lot of NBA friends, like dudes that I would hang out with. But Lorenzo Wright, God rest his soul, was. was was somebody that played the game with ferocity every night, so it didn't matter. Practice when we hooped in the summertime, this nigga would be ready to fight in the summer. If you fight, like you ain't playing hard enough, um, so I, I would I would put him for the simple fact of how hard he played the game. Toughest NBA matchup? Oh, Allen Iverson. That's, that's a no brainer. <laughs> And that, that doesn't have to be explained. It, that's just, yeah. it says it itself. Yeah, that, nobody. Anybody um, need an explanation on that? Turn, turn this off. Just, just exactly. Turn it off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was your favorite city to uh, visit? Uh, I'm a big, I'm a big Toronto fan. I love, I love, I, I really enjoy going to Toronto. I like, I like the diversity of of, of, of all cultures that's there. Uh, and it's like a it's like a super clean New York City, um, and then all of the nice weather places, Phoenix, Miami, uh, and those a lot of those places that I can go golf. You know, during NBA season, during the winter time, so we get a chance to go to those those nice cities. I head straight to a golf course. <laughs> all right, so we got a couple more, and then we'll we'll wrap this up. You played against Jordan, was able to see him firsthand, as you mentioned. Who's your goal? Oh, Michael Jordan. Man, listen, he won six championships, went there six times. He was the most unstoppable player that I know. Like, of course, Kareem had the unstoppable stoppable sky hook. Oh. Will Chamberlain was just bigger and more athletic than everybody else and was skill-wise beyond everybody else. Uh, but Michael Jordan, to me uh, – embodies a champion like everything he did was championship uh dna so that he's my goal we down to the last three who are the top five players from jersey in your opinion jersey and yourself that's how we somebody got else asked, somebody else asked me this man i told him i was like i'm not good at this because there's so many people like so the people that I would say is like Rod Rhodes was it was 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 that way, like like I always put Ira Bowman in that because like Ira took Seton Hall prep to a whole nother level, like and was for his years there was, I mean he he was unstoppable. Um, Wagner down in in Camden, I mean just that's just speaks for itself with the way that he 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 scored the basketball. And then there, there's probably like some guys that were before me, like Jersey guys that 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 were older, that were really like Chris Gent was a guy like, like that that people won't talk a lot about, but Chris Gent was phenomenal <laughs> when he when he played. I think he went to Sparta. I think he was at Sparta before, and then went to Ohio State. Um, uh, somebody people were talking about my boy Eric Williams. And with and, and coming out of Newark, if I got to give a give a shout out to somebody coming out of the Newark area, uh, I, I, w- I would get that to eat. <laughs> All right. Um, who's your Super Bowl champion this year? 
Super Bowl champs, man. I'm going with that bad man, mm-hmm. Aaron Rodgers mm-hmm. and the Green Bay Packers. Oh, uh, Greg gonna feel so so good because he picked them. So <laughs> that's a that's a Giants fans. We we think alike. That's it. We about to record an episode after this. I know he's gonna bring it up. I know he. <laughs> hey, I'm two for two, like Daniel Jones and, he said, and, and, and the Packers. <laughs> I'm, I'm great. You gotta have Kevin more often. <laughs> 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 Last question. Five people dead or alive that you want to have a meal with? Ooh, five people dead or alive. I would love to have a sit down. I would love to have a meal with Barack Obama. That that's a that would be a that would be a must. Um I would love to be able to sit down and have a meal with my my dad's mom and dad. Like I never really had a chance to meet my grandparents uh on my dad's side, even though um, I think I was three or four when my grandmother on his side died, but I don't really, I don't remember her um, at all. So to sit down with the two of them would be phenomenal. Uh, to sit down with Dr. King would be good just to, to try to understand uh, how were you able to continue to have the mindset you did during all of the persecution that you went through um, and during that time and still be such a, a positive person. Um, I would love to sit down with Kamala Harris at this point, just to, to, to talk about the dynamic of her life uh, of, you know, not just talking about how much of, of not just being an African-American woman, but her Indian heritage also, and, and how that has all played a, uh, uh, a role in, in, in her life. Uh, and then my, my, my favorite NBA player of all time, Magic Johnson. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and that that would be just to talk about what basketball was like, but also how how he had the business mind to do all that what he did. Yo, Magic Johnson, I think he's at the blueprint for a lot of NBA players on the business aspect. Of yeah. course, he was great on the court, but I'm sure you know. Anytime you come back to Jersey, he has businesses all over Jersey. Yes, I know. <laughs> like Magic Johnson, really on the business side was ahead of his time. I think like he really took that to a whole, whole nother level. Yes. But this is our time. This is our time. This is the end of this episode of the bench mob podcast, which will be available on all streaming platforms. It will be on YouTube and probably it will be on Patreon. We haven't decided yet. It's a lot of gems in this. Y'all might have to pay for this one. Y'all, y'all, y'all <laughs> just might have to. We gonna, me and Greg going to talk about it. But Bench Mob, you know the vibes. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Bench Mob, we out. Peace. Peace.